Good morning. Good morning. I am Eddie Rogers. Now, some of you might not recognize me since I've broken down and got my hair cut, but I am the elder of the week. If there's any way I can help you, my information is in the book. Are there any announcements from anyone?
When all we can muster are sighs and groans, the Spirit knows those also. When we feel that we aren't even worthy to approach God, the Spirit goes before us and with us, and welcomes, and God welcomes us with arms open. Join with me in the unison prayer of confession found in your bulletin and in the silent time that follows. Let us confess our sins privately before the Lord. God of life and all living things, your breath fills the universe and makes it alive. We praise you, O God, for the spirit of your spirit. Your love glows through all creation and makes it one. Your presence fills every corner. Your voice fills every silence. And your heartbeat lives within every living thing. But we have failed to value the life of other people, other creatures, and the world you have given to be our home. We have failed to recognize the connectedness of all things and have brought pain through division and exclusion. We have denied your presence, ignored your voice, and forgotten your love for us and all that you have made. Lord, forgive us. We recognize the ways we have brought pain to you, to others, and to ourselves. For Jesus' sake, we ask you to breathe new life into us, wash us clean, and ignite the fire of love in our hearts again. Amen. Amen. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, with whom we have been reconciled through Christ. Thanks be to God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have confessed our sins. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
do you know what? That is a very special thing. Did you know that there is one thing that all Christians all over the world that we share in common? One thing, just like maybe you all have something in common with your brothers and sisters and family members at home. What might be the thing that I'm, that I'm thinking about that Christians share? Baptism, maybe? Yep, baptism. That's right. Baptism is something. Um, wait, I, wait, wait, wait. It's something we all share in common. And then there's something else that's different up here today. I don't know if y'all notice what's happening over on the Lord's table. The baptism's here. What about on the Lord's table? Do you see anything different? That's right. We are also going to share our other sacrament today, the sacrament of communion. And so after we're baptized and as we're growing in our faith, we come back to the table to remember Jesus' body and blood. So we are doing these things on the other thing that Logan noticed that was different, Pentecost, our church's birthday. What a blessing that we at this church get to celebrate the birth of the church with a baptism, with Lord's Supper, and one thing that's going to happen later with confirmation when Jacob and Nathan join the church. So today is a very special day. We have baptism. We have communion. We have confirmation. We get to celebrate that we share the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father, Father thank you for today. Thank you for today. And this time together. Please help us to remember that we are all your children as we share the Lord's Supper and celebrate baptism and have confirmation. In Jesus' name. desire for your disturbing peace and fire us with longing to speak your uncontainable word through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Our first reading today is Act 2, 1 through 21. You can find it on page 119 in the New Testament of your pew Bible. Listen to God's words for you. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, 
and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds and power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
our second reading this morning. If you would stand with me while we share it together this morning. It is Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. You can find it on page 158 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. Friends, listen to God's word for you. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness within our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday, and I imagine that many of us might not know exactly what to do with it. Because, I mean, after all, Harmart doesn't sell Pentecost cards. There's no flame-shaped Reese's peanut butter cups. Thankfully, a couple of wonderful people got me leftover um, egg ones, so I'm not out. But there are none of those. There's not even a Pentecost pinwheel at the dollar store that we could go and buy. We had to make our own Holy Spirit fire at worship committee on Thursday. And so the outside world has no idea that today is Pentecost. That it's a very important day in the life of the church. And we know that it's important because today is the day when we remember the coming of the Holy Spirit. The original pouring out, like J.C. read from the book of Joel. Pour, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. We remember the time that happened on the first Pentecost Sunday when the disciples were gathered together and suddenly the room was filled with this rushing wind even stronger than our air conditioner and flames were over each of the disciples' heads. The Spirit came boldly and wildly and it carried the disciples out into the street where Peter, where Peter preached the good news of the gospel. And all of a sudden they heard it in their own languages, all of those hard names of places where people had come from, they heard the gospel in their own native tongue. It was the birthday of the church. It was the beginning of the new era in the way that God was going to relate to God's people. No longer were they corralled by God's word as they were in the Old Testament times. Not even were they led by Jesus physically walking before them. No, now the Spirit of God, the holy wind and fire, would light in the hearts of the believers and send them out so that they could transform the world. And they would take to the world the good news of a new identity. And so it's a very exciting holiday, Pentecost Sunday, but it's also a little bit scary. The fire everywhere, it's intimidating as the wind blows. You see, because wind and fire are very difficult to keep in a box. And we like things that fit neatly in a box. And so we struggle with Pentecost. We Presbyterians especially struggle. For heaven's sakes, y'all, a half of our Constitution is called the Book of Order. We like things decent and in order, predictable. And there's just not much predictable about a spirit that will blow any way the spirit chooses to blow, shaking the foundations of what we know to be true. Now, we are not, thankfully, alone in our struggle with the meaning of Pentecost. You see, ever since that first Pentecost Sunday, the church has struggled in each and every generation to understand what will it mean for us, the church of today, to be people of Pentecost. How will we determine how God is leading us and whom the Spirit is calling us? To follow how God is molding us 
a particular group of people to be. Now that struggle of discernment is a huge part of what it means to be the church. To be the church is to struggle to discern the Spirit's guidance. As we follow one step at a time, never being able to see too far off, we follow that path individually in our lives as each of us tries to discern what the Spirit is calling us to do, but we also are called to follow the Spirit as a group of people. We recognize that there's no one-size-fits-all plan. What works for you may not work for me. God is calling this congregation to be a unique <coughs> body of believers. And yet, despite all of those different shapes and sizes and directions that the Spirit might lead God's people, we all share one thing, one identity. Through faith in Jesus Christ, no matter how different we are, we are children of God. And that is what we celebrate on this Pentecost Sunday. Now, on those first few decades following Jesus' ascension and Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had to work overtime. That's how I have come to understand those books and those miracles. The Holy Spirit had to work overtime to establish a strong foundation for what would become generation after generation of Christians to follow. And one way that the Spirit did that was through the apostles that were sent and those who wrote the letters that we have contained in our New Testament. Today's lesson comes from one of those letters. It's the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul's letter to the people in Rome, people he had never met. And Romans is one of the most important books in the Bible about how Christians will follow the Spirit. What does it mean to be a child of God? In chapter 8 in Romans, is actually one of the most beautiful chapters in all of Scripture. And theologians have written countless volumes just on this chapter and what it means to be a child of God. And so as we together are reflecting on these four little verses from chapter 8 in Romans, in the year 2022 in the city of Hanahan, we have time to reflect, to remember, and to dream. We remember who we are. We remember whose we are. And together, let us dream of who God is calling us to be. As we work together with God and one another to receive the inheritance that God has given just for us. And so as Paul um, tries to explain what it means to be the church, he begins by reminding the Romans who they are, and, as importantly, who they are not in their relationship with Christ. He says, for all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. And so, who we are. As children of God, we are people who have been adopted by God. We have a new name. We have a new identity. And just like it will take time to develop your identity within our own families as we go throughout those years of growing up, it takes time to figure out who we are as children of God. And so today we are going to welcome Jacob and Nathan as official members of the congregation. Now, they've always been children of God. This is nothing new. But today marks a major step on their journeys of faith as they stand before you and profess what they believe. Over the past few months, they worked with Mary and with Trish each Sunday to learn some basics about what it means to be a Christian. They've learned that what it means is to be God's child, to be a member of the church. But they've also had to learn about what it doesn't mean. For example, it isn't a club that they're joining today. That's not what it means. It's an identity. Confirmation isn't a goal 
that you work toward. It's just a milestone on a journey. Baptism isn't needed for salvation, but it is a sign of God's saving covenant. Sometimes what we are and what we aren't go hand in hand. And so in the same way, Paul emphasizes for the Romans what it does not mean to be a child of God. Paul says being God's child means that we are not enslaved by fear anymore. Now you see, Paul had just finished explaining the fact that our relationship with Jesus Christ means that we are no longer going to be ruled by the carnal desires of our flesh. No longer will our hearts be governed by selfishness or lust or greed or whatever those desires are. To live in the Spirit means to turn from sin and to embrace righteousness. But see, there's always this danger when we connect the dots of works and grace. The danger is that we could fall back into legalism and somehow believe that it's our job to earn God's love and acceptance that we need to be enough, that we just need to do enough. And when we are enough and do enough, God will love us. And so Paul emphatically declares that this idea of earning God's grace is a ticket to a life that will be ruled by fear. We are no longer people who are trying to earn God's favor in fear that God might somehow punish us. We are God's children. We are adopted. We are part of the family, and we have the full rights that come with that identity. And so we can cry out to God the Father to help us. God isn't watching from far off, just taking notes of when we mess up so he can zap us with a lightning bolt. That's not the God we serve. Instead, God is like a loving parent alongside us, teaching us, correcting us empowering us as we follow Christ one step at a time. And so Paul warns us we are not ruled by fear anymore. I don't know about you, but even though I know this is true in my head, sometimes it can be hard to live a life that's not ruled by fear in reality. Even Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, was a man who was tormented by doubt and fear. The story is told that at night in his room, he would shout out in the midst of the struggles, I am baptized, I am baptized, I am baptized. In other words, no matter what I fear, I am God's child. I am a child of the covenant. I am a part of God's family. I am forgiven. I am more than what I fear or what I do or what I don't do. I am not ruled by fear or sin. I am baptized. Fear is one of the most powerful weapons against our faith. And yet the Apostle Paul is here to tell us that it's actually all smoke and mirrors. The things that we all fear, failure, pain, suffering, loss, sickness, those are awful experiences. They can shake us to our core. However, they are ultimately not what defines us and who we are. You see, the enemy of our faith would have us to believe that anything other than our relationship with God is what defines us. Our achievements, our most precious friends and families, our possessions, our appearance as we age. Friends, those all get taken away. But when we allow the fear of losing those things to govern our hearts, we're misplacing our sense of self-worth. We're in bondage to fear. And so the Spirit is reminding us today that the only way to freedom from fear is to build our identity on a solid foundation. When we are led by the Spirit, we are children of God. Paul writes, it is that very spirit bearing witness within our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that together we may also be glorified with him. 
Now, I know that school just got out last week and nobody wants to hear it, but I need to give you some grammar notes about this passage. You see, there's something that's lost in translation. Four times in these verses, Paul adds the Greek word, which is the prefix for together. And so what he's saying is that God is doing work together with us. The Spirit is testifying together with our spirit that we are children of God. Jesus is sharing together in our joys and in our sorrows with the bounty of his inheritance as God's son. We are suffering together with church, we will be, with Christ. We will be glorified together with him. We are not in this alone. Instead, as Pentecost people, we are in it together with God. And we are being led by the Spirit. So the guidance that God gives isn't simply handing us a road map, right? That's not what God does. He doesn't wish us luck as we head off after confirmation. Good luck with that, boys. No. Instead, it is an active leading one step at a time. It's a dance with the wind and the fire of God. It's an unpredictable and scary journey at times, but no matter where the journey takes us, we never walk the road alone. Because as Christians, our tendency is we want to draw lines. What did I do and what did God do? But what the Apostle Paul is telling us today is that it's together. They are so enmeshed. When we are one in the Spirit, the Spirit is one in us. God's will and our work are interwoven into the fabric that makes up our lives. So when I was a little girl, my parents brought me to church almost every Sunday. It was a big deal when we got to miss. Um, I came to Sunday school and youth group and mission trip. And all along the way, I continued to hear this one message again and again in different forms. You are a child of God. You have received the spirit of adoption and are no longer ruled by fear. And as I grew and this words kept coming, the spirit testified in my spirit. And I figured out that it was true. And trusting that one truth has changed everything in my life. And so as I read these words this past week, the Spirit led me on to the next right step forward as I wonder, what would happen if this was the focus of our identity as the church, the focus of our ministry, if all Christians came together with the Spirit of God to testify to one another that we are heirs, co-heirs with Christ, that Christ is here together with us, sharing in our suffering, sharing in our joys, leading us one step at a time so that together with Christ, we can glorify God. What if this is more than we could ever even imagine? What if Christians were known for inviting people into this reality that I just described? What if that was the most important thing that we did as God's people? Friends, we are Pentecost people. Regardless of what the enemy of our faith may say, we are no longer ruled by sin or fear. We are children of God. Our sin does not get the final word. Our fear cannot keep us in bondage. Instead, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can cry out, Abba, Father, and he will help us in our weakness. This doesn't mean that we don't suffer. We will. Our hearts and our bodies will be broken and bruised. However, all of that will eventually pass. And one thing will remain. Our relationship with God and God's family. Our share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ. 
because the spirit of adoption has brought each of us into this family and promises that he will guide us one step at a time, the peaks and the valleys and everywhere in between. And this news is too good of news for us to keep in this room. Let us share it with our children. Let us share it with our friends. Let us share it with our neighbors. Let's even share it with our enemies. Maybe, most importantly, let's share it with them. Because the Spirit is testifying within our spirits today, and now we need to follow the Spirit's guidance as we remember who we are and we live into the dream of God's glorious inheritance that he has prepared for you and for me and for every child of God that will come. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now come to the time in our worship service where we will respond to God's word with a service of confirmation and the sacrament of baptism. As I come down, I'm going to invite Trish and Mary and Nathan and Jacob to come forward so that we can share in this time together. Thank you. 
church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Jacob and Nathan, will you be a faithful member of this congregation as you share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and your gifts, your study and your service? And so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, will you, with God's help? And now Trish will pour the waters of baptism as together we pray the prayer that is printed in your bulletin. Father, pour out your spirit on us that we may participate again in your baptism. May all who pass through these waters be delivered from death to life from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness, to you be praise, honor, and glory, through Jesus Christ our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns forever. Amen. Jacob? What is your full Christian name? Jacob Tyler Steele, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and I mark you somewhere with the sign of the cross. You are God's child. Let us pray. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your Spirit you are at work in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Jacob and Nathaniel to this time and place of affirming the covenant that you made with them in their baptism. Establish them in your truth and guide them by your Spirit, that together with all your people they may grow in faith, hope, and love and be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. We now come to the time in worship where we are all invited to respond to God's goodness as we give our tithes and offerings. Friends, I invite you to give generously as the Lord has given to you.
gifts which are given in faith, trusting that you will guide us as we glorify you through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Christ's body, and this is his blood, broken and shed for the remission of sin of all the world. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this meal of remembrance and for coming to us in the Spirit's power as we have shared it. May the love we find at this table be reflected in our lives. May the power we receive at this table make us peacemakers and healers. And may the Spirit who fills us again at this table lead us to be those who proclaim God's reign in every word we see and in everything we do. For Jesus' sake.
invite you all to join us for fellowship following this time of worship together. There's something special for Jacob and Nathan that needs a little note from you. Remember, teenagers don't really read a lot of cursive these days. So if you could print a nice note and sign it legibly, that would be helpful so they would know what it is you're saying. <laughs> Friends, we are Pentecost people. The Spirit of God blows where the Spirit of God blows. And the Spirit is here, sending us out into the world. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and grant you peace, this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.